All right, so 1 John chapter 3. There's a lot of verses in here, and I've preached on this topic in the past, but it's, it's important that we get a really good grasp and understanding of this. There's some difficult verses, especially for like newer believers, people, you know, it, you can be thrown for a loop when you read this, specifically a verse that says like, um, verse number 6, for example, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Or um, verse 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. These verses, you can look at that and be like, wow, what in the world is that? That looks like a contradiction to me. That looks like, uh, you know, how, how can that possibly be when I know that we're all sinners, I know that even after you're saved, you still sin. So how can this say that whosoever is born, does that mean that nobody's born of God? No. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to help you understand this passage. Because John here is being very blunt and very straightforward with what he's saying. But even within chapter 3, we have to take this in the context of the whole book. Now, it would be ridiculous to think that He's forgotten what he's already written in, in chapter 1. And now he's just completely contradicting himself. And if you want to just flip back to chapter 1, this is our memory verse. In chapter 1, verse number 8, the Bible reads, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You say, well, wait, 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 what do you mean? I mean... You just said later, though, that whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. How can you say that if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, the truth is not in us? And in verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. How can that be? Well, that is because in John, in, excuse me, in chapter number 3 here, what he's explaining here is the new man. It's the new creature. There's a new birth that takes place. At just as Jesus Christ spoke of being born again in John chapter 3, he was explaining to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And we're born of an incorruptible seed. We're born of the word of God. The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word of God that you receive when you hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ, that word is the seed that enters into your heart. When you believe the Word, when you put your faith in the Word, that seed is conceived and a new birth is born. You have a new creature, a new spirit residing inside you. Your spirit is born again. That is the new man. Now, what he explains here is that he says in... Uh, Verse 9, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, that whosoever is the new man. That is the new man that is born of God. It says that, that man does not commit sin. Why? For his seed remaineth in him. The seed is the word of God, right? And he cannot sin because he is born of God. It's impossible for the new creature, for the new man, to commit sin. Because it's born of God. It's... it's, it's, it's was conceived through the Word of God. And just as Jesus didn't sin, the new man doesn't sin. But the reason why we can say, hey, if you say that you haven't sinned, you know, you're a liar, the truth isn't in you, is because we still have the flesh. So we have multiple parts. We're made up of three parts, right? We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. And right now, these three are one within us. Just as God is the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and those three are one. Well, we have three that are one right now. So, when you could say, well, I'm born again, so I don't sin. Well, your spirit doesn't sin. That new creature doesn't sin. That's right. But you still have the flesh that is driving you to sin. So, when you say that I don't sin, you know, if you're including your, you know, the body is typically included. And that's normally when you say, you know, uh, the, the common usage and understanding throughout the whole Bible. This is a real specific truth that he's teaching here. But all throughout the Bible, it's saying, you know, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, everything. Like that. Look, we're all sinners. 
It's referring to you as a person, your, your, your entirety. Even if you're born again, you still sin because you have this flesh. And the Apostle Paul war talks about the warfare that goes on between the spirit and the flesh, and these two are contrary to, the, to one another. I think I actually have that in my notes here. Yeah, turn if you would to Romans chapter 7. But what I'm preaching about this morning is the fact that we are a son of God and how, how great that is. Verse number 1 of 1 John 3, I'll just reread it for you. We read the whole chapter already. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And it's just an amazing concept that not only is our soul saved from going to hell, but God actually makes us his sons. We're born into his family. And, you know, we don't think about that very often. Now, I know I, I use the analogies when we're out soul winning, and I'll explain how if you're born again, you know, God's your father and everything else. But just sit there and grasp, you know, the manner of love that God has given us that we could be called his sons. And, and what that means for you to be in God's family as his child. It's like, I mean, it, and, and this, this comparison is, is, is way, way off. But think about like if you were born into a royal family or some, you know, some family where the person, you know, the family is just really lifted up and everybody looks up to them, and, and to be a part, I mean, you'd be a different person, right? I mean, you, you'd live a different life than everyone else because you're part of this special family. So when you try to think about in terms of just worldly speaking, you think about people, oh man, what would it be like to be, I, don't, I can't even think of so, you know, so-and-so's, you know, to be born into this family of royalty or whatever and how different your life would be and you have this mansion and you you know and people all look up to you and when you speak they listen and they respect you and everything else think about how much greater it is because there's no example that can that can compare to being born into God's family I mean God Almighty the creator of heaven and earth God who made everything God whose word we we live by and we love and we cherish and we respect and God who has all power over everything we're born into his family we're his children It's an amazing concept even to think about And this morning I kind of want to go through some of the points of being a son of God and I also want to dispel some, some false doctrine that's out there as well regarding sons of God or being a son of God. The first aspect we see here is that as a son of God, a son of God doesn't commit sin. That new spirit does not sin. You're in Romans chapter 7. Look at verse number 14. The Bible reads, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For, that I would, for what I would, that I do not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. So it, it, it could be a little bit confusing here with the woods and, the, and, and, and doing, he says in verse 15. So basically, the things that I do, He's saying, I don't want to do those. Those are the things that I don't allow. Those are the things that are against God's rules or God's commands. You know, when I sin, he's saying, the things that I'm doing, I'm sinning. You know, I don't want to do those things for what I would or what I want. You could just, you know, think of the word would here is just basically what I want to do, that do I not. He's saying, the things that I really want to do, I'm not doing them. But the things I don't want to do, those are the things that I'm doing. But, but what I hate, that do I, right? He hates sin. He hates the transgression of God's laws. Yet he does those things. Why? Because he's got this flesh. And we'll see that here in a minute. He says, if then I do that, which I would not, if I do the things I don't want to do, I consent unto the law that it is good. Not the bad acts that he did were good, but the law is good. He says, I consent unto the law. You know, the law is still good. Even though I'm doing things I don't want to do, hey, the law is still there. The law is good. The law is righteous. Verse 17, now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And 
he's referring to again here, it's another way of stating what John is stating in 1 John chapter 3. The fact that he has a new creature, a new spirit. It's not me that's doing it, me as in the new man. It's not the spirit doing this. It's the sin that dwells in me. In the, he says, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh. In parentheses, he clarifies saying, you know, in me, well, when I say in me, I'm referring to in my flesh, in my body, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. He's saying the will is there. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit wants to do what's right, but the flesh keeps dragging me down and, and making it so that I can't quite do the things that I really want to do inside. The things that my spirit is driving me to do, my flesh is causing me not to do these things. Verse 19, For the good that I would, I do not. The things I want to do are good, I, can't, I don't do them. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And which is as members, he's talking about his body. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? The body is death because the body can't do that which is good, as we just read in here. The body is sinful. The body is what causes us to get into sin. And he's saying, look, I just want to be delivered from this body. And you know what? Praise God, one day we will be because we're going to get new bodies. When Jesus Christ comes back at the sound of the trump, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be changed. And we're going to receive new bodies. You know, at the resurrection, when the dead in Christ rise first, and us which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air. And, and the clouds, so, so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's when we're going to receive our new body. And this old body is gone. And we'll be transformed or transfigured with a new body, which is not sinful, which will not drive us into sin. And then we'll be complete with our, our spirit being born of God, which cannot sin, and then losing this flesh which does which is the flesh is what causes us to sin we won't have that anymore we'll have a new body which will not be corrupted it will not cause us to sin verse 25 i thank god through jesus christ our lord so then with the mind i myself serve the law of god but with the flesh the law of sin there's a dichotomy we have a battle and it's a struggle that goes on every day and the reason why is because when you're a son of god you have a spirit, there's a new creature, the new creature doesn't sin. Now, I want to point out here real quick before we move it for, further anymore. Last week I preached on, uh, you know, sort of beware of dogs. And it was about the reprobate. And I briefly touched on uh, blasphe blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Blaspheming the, you know, the unforgivable sin. And I was speaking with someone who believes that, you know, he's a little bit mixed up on his doctor, but he believes that we can, you know, a saved believer can lose their salvation because of the unforgivable sin. Well, 1 John chapter 3 is an excellent response to that. Now, unfortunately, this verse didn't pop into my mind when I was talking to him. But this is a great, if you want to highlight this, we, we've already read this multiple times, but verse number 9 of 1 John chapter 3 is a great verse to have memorized because this, this teaches that it is impossible for someone who is born of God to commit the unforgivable sin. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. So your new spirit, when you're born again, cannot commit sin. It cannot commit the unforgivable sin. It cannot, your, your new spirit cannot sin. If your new spirit cannot sin, then how is it that you could ever possibly lose your salvation and be kicked out of God's family and no longer be a son of God? 
It's impossible. The Bible clearly says you, you, the seed remains in you. You cannot sin. It's impossible to sin. It's something that can't be done. If it can't be done, then how would it be possible to lose your salvation? It's not. It's everlasting because God keeps his word. When he says it's everlasting life, it's everlasting. So the new spirit, which is what is born again. When you say, I am born again, your flesh isn't born again. Your spirit is born again. And that new birth, that new creature cannot sin. And when you die physically on this earth, what happens? Your body stays here. So what are you left with? Your soul and spirit. Why would, you, why would you not go to heaven? Why would you go to hell if you don't even have that dead body anymore? If your spirit doesn't commit sin and can't sin. Can't. It's impossible. That seals the deal right there. He says, no. The new man doesn't sin. Ever. Not once. There is nothing that you can do where God can send you to hell once you're born again because your spirit is that new man, it's a new creature. It's born of God. God has taken part in that birth. God is your father. I mean, you think about it, your father physically had an act and, and with, with hopefully a wife and you were born. You can't change who your father is. Your father has, you're basically part of your father. Part of your father is in you and you can't change that. You have his, you know, and physically we have his DNA. I have my father's DNA. Guess what? A lot of my attributes physically are very similar to my father's. Why? Because I carry his DNA. What your born again spirit has God in you because the seed is the word. And that remains in you. It doesn't go away. It's something that's permanent. What a great thing to be called the Son of God. To know that whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. We're talking about sons of God, that new creature. How do we become a son of God? John chapter 1. But as many as received him, to them gave me power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The moment you put your faith in Jesus, the moment that you believe, or as it says here, received him, receive Christ, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. Not everyone's a son of God. And we're going to be getting into the, the false doctrine that's out there regarding who the sons of God are. See, there's people who believe that, that sons of God is, you know, in some places of the Bible it's referring to angels, and we'll get into that in just a little bit. I have a few more points I want to get to before we get to that. But I want to, I want to preface what, what we're going into here with being a son of God. Now, I just want to point out this because this isn't even in my notes. If you're going to say that an angel is a son of God, because what some people will try to define a son of God as is, well, one of you know, God's creation. Because God made you, that makes you a son of God. Oh, really? Is a giraffe a son of God? Because God made giraffes. God made bears. God made animals. Are the animals sons of God? Would you say, oh yeah, it's a son of God? No, that's stupid. And I, you know, I've recently been commenting with someone on YouTube and they're trying to say, oh yeah, but there's so many similarities with the, you know, like the angels you know, do this and they do this and they have free will and all this other stuff. But the Bible never calls the angels sons of God. Never. And we'll get into, I'll get into the verses that, that people will try to prop up and use and say, see, here's talking about angels and, it's, and it says sons of God. And you really have to do mental, mental acrobats to try to get that to fit. The Bible says here, so if an angel were a son of God, then they can't commit sin. Because in order to be a son of God, his seed has to remain in you. 
You have to be born of God to be called a son of God. But we know that many of the angels have sinned. We see that God's given them free will. But see, we don't know very much about angels at all. Anyways, I mean, it's very, there, there's references to angels. And, you know, by the way, the word angel means messenger. So when you see angel, it doesn't necessarily even mean that it's referring to a supernatural being. The Bible even refers to Jesus Christ as an angel. Does that mean that Jesus Christ is the same physical creature as these supernatural beings who are called angels? The angels I referred to in Hebrews chapter 1? No. No, because Jesus Christ was made a man. And there is definitely a difference between men and angels. Now, we know what our plan of salvation is through God's word. We have no idea if God even offers salvation unto angels. Like Satan, is, is it possible for Satan to get saved? I don't think so because we already know God's going to throw him into the lake of fire. And he's going to be there forever and ever and ever. As well as, as the devils that followed him, which were angels previously. So whatever God's deal is with them, it's not clearly laid out. It's not recorded. But if we're going to look at Scripture and we're going to determine and use terms and use words to define different creatures or different people or whatever, we ought to make sure that we're, we're being accurate with the terminology that we use. So when you're talking about angels, you can't call them the sons of God. And one of those reasons is because, hey, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. The fallen angels commit sin. De the devil, Satan, commits sin. Do you have your Romans 7 still? Turn if you go to Romans 8. We'll get some more information on being a son, son of God. We saw in John chapter 1, we get, the, we get the power to become a son of God when we believe on his name. And just another aspect of that too. I mean, we are required to have faith to be saved. Why is it that we have to believe or have faith? Because we can't see God. We can't see Him. We, 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 we are not in God's presence and could just see and just be like, of course. Because if you were in God's presence and you could see Him, you wouldn't have to believe because the evidence would be right there. You'd be like, you know, they, they, it wouldn't take faith to believe that it's true. I don't need faith to believe that, oh, look, there's a blue songbook right now on my pulpit. Now, if I wasn't here and I was someone else and someone told me, hey, guess what? There's a blue songbook on your pulpit. You know, if I hadn't already seen it and known it, I would have to take that on faith. I'd have to just believe what, what I'm being told. But if you see it and you're around it, you know, so that's why the angels, they can't be saved by faith. They know God's real. They're in his presence. They, they, you know, they, they go and... You know, in, in communication with God. Anyways, God sends them to deliver messages unto us. God sends them to be ministering spirits and all this other stuff. And we'll get, again, we'll get into that. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But angels don't get saved by believing on Jesus Christ because they don't need to believe. And we do, and that's how we become a son of God at all. We become part of God's family when we believe on Jesus Christ. That's how you become a son of God. At least that's for us. So people say, oh yeah, but it's different for angels. They're already sons of God. And again, using that, using that illustration that because they're created, that makes them a son of God is ridiculous because the Bible talks about God forming and fashioning us in, his, in the womb. That's before you're born. Hey, God's making you and creating you. Physically, just because, I mean, everybody, you could say, is physically created by God. Then you'd have to say everyone's a son of God, then, because God physically creates everybody in the womb. It falls apart. Because then why would John chapter 1 say that you have power to become a son of God? 
Romans chapter 8, look at verse number 9. The Bible reads, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. But if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Again, if you're born again, you're born of the Spirit, you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And if you don't have the Spirit of Christ residing in you, you're not His. You're not born again. You're not part of God. So he says, you're not in the flesh. You're in the Spirit if you're born again. Verse number 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Talk about the hope of the resurrection and our, and our resurrection. We have the example of Jesus Christ being raised from the dead to give us proof and understanding that, hey, just as Christ was raised again, we will be raised also. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And this is a verse I've, I've seen ripped out of context. And that's why we read the context so we understand what he's talking about. See, the angels are led by the Spirit of God because God tells them what to do and all this other stuff. They'll say, so they're the sons of God. No, in the context here, what he's talking about of being in the Spirit is the Spirit being in you. He's talking to people that are born again, that have the Spirit of Christ in them. And that is why they're led by the Spirit, because the Spirit is residing in them. The angels are spirits. They don't have the Spirit of God residing in them the way that we do. It just, it, it's not there. This is completely referring to people and this definition for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. If you're born again, you have the Spirit of God inside of you and you are a son of God. That's that simple. It's exactly the same as John chapter 1. You use the same definition for the sons of God. That's, uh, we see now two times definitions given for sons of God in the Bible referring to people who are born again believers. No mention of angels anywhere in these chapters. Not even brought up at, at all. Verse number 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children then heirs, Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Being a child of God puts you at liberty. We're free from the curse of the law. And not only that, it says if we're children, then we're heirs. Heirs. That means you have an inheritance. So the same way that, that you know, if when my parents pass away, they will leave an inheritance to their children and I, not by any virtue, I just will receive that because I was born into their family. Because I'm a son, I'm a child of theirs, I will receive an inheritance. Well, God says the same way that you receive inheritance here physically, you have an inheritance in heaven. And what a great inheritance to have. You know, the Bible talks about having a mansion prepared for you that Jesus Christ himself prepared for us. And um, we're joint heirs with Christ. We're in this together. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, right? And it says here we're joint heirs with him. We're like right next to him. We're joint heirs together. Now, I'm going to get a little bit more into that strange doctrine here. Just so you're aware of it, you know, 
I'm not going to... I'm going I'm to show you the verses that they refer to. But I just don't, I don't like people getting deceived by these, these strange, bizarre doctrines that are out there. Because, especially with the internet, it seems to be propagating so much more. People like to, to believe in all kinds of different things. I mean, there's people, have you ever seen the, the, the you know, like, I want to believe? Right? Has anyone ever seen that? I've seen that, like, about UFOs or aliens. I've seen it, say, like, these pictures, say, like, I want to believe. It's like people just, they're just dying to believe that there really is, you know, aliens out there. And they just, they want to believe it so bad that they believe it because they want to. Not because, oh, there's all this evidence and stuff. And because people want to, they'll try to produce evidence. And they'll say all these various things. And it's a similar thing, I believe, with this strange doctrine of angels. And, you know, and this is where people get caught up in Nephilim, which is really just a Hebrew word of means giants. But they'll try to make it sound, oh, Nephilim. Oh, yeah, the, the Nephilim. This is like, you don't know about the Nephilim? I know about the Nephilim. This has been hidden from you because these pastors and churches, they, they don't want to touch this subject because they're afraid of it or whatever. You're going to get kicked out. No. It's not taught because it's not true. That's why it's not taught. And Nephilim just means giant. And Genesis chapter 6 talks about giants in the earth. And yeah, there were giants, but it's not because angels had intercourse with human beings. That's just nonsense. Now, the Bible says in Colossians 2, you have to turn, turn if you would, to Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20. Colossians 2 says, Let no man beguile you of your, of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. This is talking about people, now in this, in this context, it's talking about people, you know, worshiping angels and doing these other weird things, kind of like the Catholic Church does. They worship angels, right? But he says, look, don't let anyone beguile you intruding into those things which he hath not seen. People make these huge doctrines and they get upset and they fight about it and they, they argue their point. No, man, you know, the, the angels are sons of God and all this other stuff. When... It, for one, it's just not scriptural. But two, they're, they're arguing and they make up all of these things about the angels that they don't even know. We don't know. As I mentioned earlier, and I'm not afraid to say it again, that we don't know if there even is a salvation for angels. We have no idea anything about that because the Bible doesn't tell us. The Bible doesn't refer to angels as being sons of God. The Bible is always referring to men human beings becoming sons of God because we're born of God because His Word remains in us. But here, people who like to talk about things they really don't know. And they'll get dogmatic about these doctrines and start calling you names if you don't believe their weird doctrine and called out as just being a strange, bizarre doctrine. When they first just admit, you know what, we don't really know that much about angels. So, one of the proof texts they'll go to when they say that, well, see, a son of God is just God's creation. They'll turn to the genealogy in Luke chapter 3. And you don't have to turn there. Luke 3 gives a whole genealogy. And in Luke 3.38, the Bible reads, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. So it goes through this whole list going back through, you know, from Jesus Christ going all the way back down and it goes all the way down to Adam. And as it's saying, you know, it's the son of this person, the son of Seth, the son of the, you know, the son of all these people. Well, Adam didn't have a physical father on this earth, right? He didn't have, he wasn't created. So when you get to the end of the line, it just makes sense to say, yeah, well, he was the son of God. Now, for one, he was the son of God because he was saved anyways. After he sinned, he was, you know, the, the Bible gives us the reasonable reasoning to believe that he was saved when, uh, 
the, the sim symbolically, you know, the, they were given coats of skins to wear after they found a garden. They, they had their fig leaves trying to, trying to cover up their nakedness. And God, you know, killed an animal and shed innocent blood for them to be covered, which was a symbol of salvation. But no reason to believe that Adam wasn't saved, which, was all, which makes perfect sense here, even just calling him a son of God. But the way that Adam was made physically out of the ground, and which is different than everybody and everything else, and God breathing the breath of life into him, we have no record of how angels are created. We have no record. I mean, in the genealogy sense, it just makes sense. But to, to pull this out and be like, oh, see, look, it says he's the son of God here. So it, it's, it's kind of stupid if that's what you're going to base your doctrine on. Because then you could just say, oh, well, then all, everything just made by God is a son of God because it was made. Because this verse says Adam was the son of God in the physical genealogy. That's dumb. That would mean animals are sons of God too if you want to take it that way. But Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20, verse 33, the Bible reads, Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife of them is she? For, the, for seven had her to wife. You remember the, the, the Sadducees that came tempting Jesus, trying to, to trick him up in his doctrine, asking about a, a man or a woman who was married to seven brothers and none, you know, didn't have a child with any of them. So they're saying, oh, ha, ha, see? So if she was married to all of them and didn't have any children, you know, no reason that she would be specific, specifically be one brother's husband over another. Well then, you know, in the resurrection, since, you know, because they didn't believe in a resurrection. Well, in the resurrection, then whose husband is she going to be? Or whose wife is she going to be? Who's going to be her husband? He said, for seven had her to wife. And Jesus answering said unto them, the children of this world marry and are given in marriage. He said, yeah, that happens here on earth. People marry and are given in marriage. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. He's saying, but that's not the way it is. I mean, that's just the way it is here physically. You marry and you're given in marriage. But that's not the way it is in the world to come. That's not the way it is in heaven. He says, verse 36, neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels. And are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. Now, the, they are equal unto the angels there is referring to they cannot die anymore. They're immortal, just as the angels. And then he says, and are the children of God, referring to the people, not the angels, and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. There is no resurrection for the, for the angels. He said the reason why they are the children of God because they're the children of the resurrection. Angels aren't resurrected. Nowhere in the Bible can you show me an angel being resurrected. In fact, it says here that they don't die. So if they don't die, how can they be resurrected? We die. Our bodies die. We are children of the resurrection. We're the children of the resurrection through Christ. Christ rose again from the dead. Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush when he called the Lord, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, for he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. Amen. So he's saying a couple things here. Also that, you know, they don't marry or give in, in marriage. And in another passage, this same, this same um, story, he says, but there is the angels in heaven. Because the angels don't marry and they're not given in marriage. And the Bible clearly states, it says, look, the angels don't marry. They're not given in marriage. There is no talk about conception or anatomy that an angel even is capable of procreating. Nowhere in the Bible will you find that. Anywhere. Can you see that that is even possible? Nowhere is there a description. Now, can we see that angels can look like men? Yes. I mean, the Bible says that, that you know, be care, you know to, to uh, be hospitable, basically, I'm paraphrasing, because, you know, some have entertained strange uh, angels unawares. They didn't realize that they were an angel, right? So when the men came into Sodom, they were angels, right? The two men came into Sodom to get Lot and his family out. They were angels. 
They came to get him out. Now, everybody thought that they were men. I mean, the men of Sodom surrounded the house. Hey, bring those men out to us. But do we know the full, even anatomy of them? They appeared as men. But it doesn't mean that they, they function naturally as a man. The, the strange doctrine, though, will, will, will try to tell you that in Genesis 6, and I covered this pretty extensively when, I, when we're going through the book of Genesis, and especially for the chapter 6. Um, the, I'll just read it for you. It says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Okay, so what, the, what, what people will try to do is replace sons of God with angels. Say, oh, no, yeah, see, when it says sons of God, it means angels. Now, so far, we haven't seen anything in the definition of sons of God within the context of the entire Bible that would let you think that a son of God is an angel. But they want to say, oh, yeah, see, this is talking about angels. When angels saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Oh, they married the Bible says that the angels don't marry and are not given in marriage. So God or Jesus Christ says that the angels of God do not marry. But you're going to tell me that, oh, the sons of God here means angels and they got married. When Jesus said they don't get married. But they do things like this. We'll keep reading. And the Lord said, my spirit should not always strive with man. Strive with man. So he's upset about man. Why? Because the sons of God, those that were born again, men, not angels, saw the daughters of men and started marrying unsaved women and they took them wives. My spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in 120 years. God was getting upset and then there was violence filled the land. People weren't doing what he wanted them to do. They weren't following God, and they started marrying. They started marrying heathen women, people who, you know, women who are not believers. And there, those women turned their heart away from serving God, which is, again, a biblical concept. Over and over again in the Bible, you'll see that in the Mosaic Law. Look, not to marry the heathen because they're going to turn your heart away from serving God. It happened to King Solomon. His heart, he married many wives, many strange wives. And what happened? His heart was turned away from serving the Lord. It's, it's a biblical truth. That's what happened here. The sons of God saw the daughters of men. And what happens? Because this is prior to the flood. God has to send a flood out to wipe out the whole earth because men has become wicked because their heart was turned away from serving the Lord. And that's why he says, my spirit shall always strive with man. He could have said, my spirit shall not always strive with angels because these angels are going down and getting married when they're not supposed to be getting married. And they're having children with these, with these human women. That's not what it says at all. But, oh, but it says, there were giants in the earth in those days. So see, and it says, see, the giants came as a result of the procreation between angels and women. That's why there's even giants. Yet, when you look at any measurements given about giants in the Bible, they're like around 10 feet tall. Does that have to really be some supernatural thing? I mean, think about it. I'm six feet tall. Uh, you look at basketball players can get upwards of like eight feet tall, right? And that's, I mean, those are people living today, right now. There's tall people that get up, you know, upwards around eight feet tall for a person, a human being. Not some hybrid angel-human mix. Just a person. Shaquille O'Neal, right? Just a man. So a couple extra feet, does that really just have to be supernatural to, to, to fathom? And I don't, I mean, you can look up the Guinness Book of World Records. I haven't looked at it. I don't know how, what tall, how tall is the tallest person who's ever lived that we have on record or whatever. Probably going to be over nine feet, I'm guessing. I mean, I don't know for sure. I don't know that for a fact. Look it up. But we see the men in the Bible there. You know, the giants in the Bible were around 10, 11 feet tall. It's not that, it's not that difficult. But see, people today will, 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 will Photoshop pictures on the Internet and see, like, see, look, there's a human skull. And there's, like, a guy sitting next to it. And it's like this 
this gigantic, like, like the size of this room skull or something, and it's like this little person. Don't believe everything you see on the internet. That's what I gotta say about that, because there's so much doctored photos out there, and people just eat it up, and they swallow it, and there's no reason to do that. So it says there are giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, after what? After there were giants in the earth in those days, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. I mean, this verse alone destroys the doctrine of giants being these hybrid between angels and, and men or women. Because it says clearly, after there were giants in the earth in those days, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, they bare children. And they were men of renown. They were mighty men. Um, so that's one place, Genesis 6. I'm going to try to hurry up through this. I don't want to spend too much time. Job chapter 1, they'll say, uh, Job 1 and 2, it's basically the same thing. I'm not going to read both of them. Job 1, 6 says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. See, the sons of God there are talking about angels. You can't prove that at all. Now, unless you can show me proof, and here's the thing, unless you can show me proof that like, even anywhere in the Bible, the sons of God are referring to angels. I mean, I can't, you can't just take a verse like this. Let, let's just say, for example, that, that sometimes the word the sons of God reference means angels. You cannot prove that this is referring to angels here. If that were even true, that the sons of God can sometimes be referring to angels. Because it just says there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Okay. People, oh, I guess this is why, because people get mixed up in other false doctrines that believe that Old Testament believers didn't go to heaven, right? They'll believe that there is this compartment, compartment called paradise that's actually in hell, so that believers in the Old Testament went to hell. But then later, paradise was, was transformed from the center of the earth to heaven. It, Stupid. I'm not, not going to take the time to go into that. But that's probably the reason why people will make that leap of saying, well, see what says sons of God here. I can't be talking about human beings because human beings didn't, didn't go, to, go to heaven when they died. Believers didn't go to heaven. But here, they're presenting themselves before the Lord. No, believers have always gone to heaven. The Bible doesn't teach some weird doctrine that paradise is hell. That's a, that's a, a, whole, that's a whole other sermon. But here we see there's no reason why believers can't present themselves before the Lord in heaven. None. It says, And Satan came also among them. So there's a reference to the sons of God. And then in Job 38, verse 4, the Bible reads, Where was thou? And he's talking, this is, this is God talking to Job. It's right near the end of Job. And he's, and he's, you know, making a point with Job you know, about how powerful he is and, 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 and you know, whatever, trying to get a, a change of attitude from Job. But he says here in Job 38, 4, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth? as if it had issued out of the womb. When I made the cloud, the garment thereof, and thick darkness a swaddling, for, a swaddling band for it, and break up for it my decreed place, and set bars and doors, and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and there shall thy proud waves be stayed. So they'll say, see, here it's talking about the creation, and it's saying when the sons of God shouted for joy, that that has to be referring to angels. Because when God created everything, there were no humans that were saved that were in heaven at that time. But this verse isn't talking about the creation. So let's start here again because we're getting the whole thing in context. Verse 4, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Okay, laying the foundations of the earth could be talking about the creation, right? Who hath laid the measures thereof? 
if thou knowest. So now he has, he jumps from asking about the foundations of the earth to just how big is the earth? To who hath laid the measures thereof? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Who can measure there? I mean, it's huge. We have measurements today, but they're still not completely accurate. I mean, there's only so much you can do within reason because it's just such a big thing to measure. And he's saying, who can measure it? And then he asks, whereupon are the foundations are fastened? Okay, how, how does it even work? Where, where is it fastened to? The foundations of the earth. He's not talking about the creation. He's just saying, well, how, how is it even held up? Where are the foundations fastened to? You're so smart, tell me. Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? Now, I get that there's a dual meaning here. He's saying he's referring to the foundations of the earth and the cornerstone. But the earth doesn't have a cornerstone the way that we build buildings with cornerstones. So the cornerstone that he's referring to here is talking about Jesus Christ, and it makes perfect sense. Who laid the cornerstone thereof when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Was there rejoicing when Jesus Christ was born? You better believe it. Luke chapter 2, read about it. The angels, a heavenly host, appeared and were singing praises unto God and they shouted and sang with joy. But no, they want to say, see, no, this is talking about the creation. No, this is talking about Jesus Christ being the cornerstone. Because the earth does not have a physical cornerstone. And then he goes into talking about the flood, or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth. When it break forth, he's talking about the flood. It's not even talking about creation there. So you can't just say, oh, this is all talking about creation. No, it's not. Nice try, but sons of God here is still not saying, you can't say, oh, this is, this is talking about angels. No. The sons of God shouted for joy because there were sons of God in heaven when Jesus Christ was born. When the cornerstone. Turn if you to Hebrews chapter 1. I want you to see Hebrews chapter 1. Those are just some of the verses. And, you know, it's not completely exhaustive. But you can see where we're going with that. Calling the angels sons of God and, and that like that's the bulk of their proof or evidence that angels are sons of God. Hebrews chapter one. Verse number four, being made so much better than the angels, talking about Jesus Christ, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Remember earlier we're reading about being heirs. If we're sons, then we're heirs. If we're sons of God, then we're joint heirs with Christ. Because we, excuse me, we are sons of God. Why was Jesus better than the angels? Because he has an inheritance. Which means the angels don't have an inheritance. But we do have an inheritance because we are the sons of God. Because we are joint heirs with Christ. But the angels are not joint heirs with Christ. They don't have an inheritance. If they don't have an inheritance, Brother Sebastian, can you get that for me? How can they be called the sons of God? I'll keep reading here. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. You say, oh yeah, yeah, he's just talking about Jesus Christ, though, because he said Jesus Christ is his son, and this day have I begotten thee. Yeah, but he's asking a question, when did he ever say that to an angel? Unto which of the angels? You tell me, if an angel is a son of God, you're going to tell me that an angel is a son of God, but God has never said, you're my son. Thou art my son. He's never said that one time. But they're his sons. But God has never called them his son. He's never said, you're my son, to an angel. According to Hebrews 1.5. But you're going to tell me that angels are sons of God. This day have I begotten thee. 
And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, so he's talking about Jesus Christ, he's talking about being a son of God, and then he says, unto the angels, now, now let's talk about these angels, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. So he says the angels are spirits. But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, a scepter of righteousness, a scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. And they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Angels minister unto the heirs, because they are not heirs. They are not joint heirs. They do not have an inheritance because they're not a son of God. Now one point I just, I just remembered, I forgot to bring up when we were looking at Job and they're saying that, you know, oh, the sons of God shouted for joy when, when God laid the, the cornerstone of the earth. And, and they're saying that's talking about the creation. If that's true, if, if, if what they're saying is true, then that would mean... That would contradict Genesis 1.1, the first verse of the whole Bible. If angels were present as God laid the, corner, the foundation, the cornerstone of the whole earth at creation, if the angels were already there to see that, then that would mean God would have had to make the angels before he made the earth. But in Genesis 1.1, the Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, the first thing, the first thing that God made was the heaven and the earth. It doesn't say in the beginning, God created the angels, and then he made the heaven and the earth. No. God, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. He talks about the earth. So how were there angels around to see God lay the cornerstone of the earth when the Bible says that's the first thing he did. The sons of God cannot be the angels. You're in Hebrews 1. Just flip over to Hebrews chapter 2. I'll read for you from Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3.26 says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That's why we're the children of God. That's why we're a son of God. It's by faith in Christ Jesus. Angels don't have faith. They don't need faith. They can see that he's real. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Again, heirs, inheritance. It's made by promise. Hebrews chapter 2, look at verse number 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man, for it became him. For whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Talking about Jesus being the Savior, <coughs> bringing sons unto glory because he's the Savior, because he saved them. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church while I sing praise unto thee. What an amazing statement there that Jesus Christ says he's not ashamed to call us his brethren, his brothers. We're brothers with the Son of God because we are sons of God. 
We are only sons of God because we have Christ in us. Because we are born of God. Angels do not have that quality. It's not, it's not part of their existence. They are not joint heirs with Christ. They do not have Christ in them. They are not led by the Spirit. All of these things, they refer to the sons of God. But Jesus calls us his brothers. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. We're in his family and he's, he's not even ashamed to call us his brother. Verse 13, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. The children, the sons of God. Guess what? As much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, are the, are the angels partakers of flesh and blood? Hebrews 1 said that they're spirits. That they're ministering spirits. Here it's saying that they're, the children are partakers of flesh and blood. The Bible says flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You're going to tell me angels are in heaven and they're flesh and blood? I don't think so. The children, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels. The nature of angels is different than the nature of men. The nature of men is flesh and blood. The nature of angels is not flesh and blood. The children are partakers of flesh and blood. Not the, look, I mean, he's making a clear difference here. Why can't these people just read Hebrews chapter 1 and 2 and see that the angels are not sons of God? For he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. His brethren. Not to be made unto the angels. Hey, if the angels are sons of God, then they're his brethren too. They would have to be. But they're not because he wasn't made like them, but rather he was made like his brethren. Human beings, men, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. There is no way he is calling any angel his brother. God never said to an angel, you're my son. It didn't happen. It, it, it never has happened one time. Yet people will dogmatically just say, oh, the sons of God are angels. If all of God's creation can be called sons, then we would all be brothers. But no, that's not true. There's a significant distinction here between the angels and his brethren. The angels are different. They don't receive salvation like we do. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 15, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. We're right, talking about salvation. If you confess that Jesus is the Son of God, it says God dwells in you and you in God. And just to prove that angels don't have salvation like that, besides the fact that they don't have to believe anyways, it doesn't take faith, if you confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that still doesn't make the angels saved. The reason why? Well, in Luke chapter 8, we see a story of devils. You remember the story of Legion? There's a man that was possessed of many devils, and Jesus you know, asked, what is, what's your name? And he said, Legion, because there's many devils in him. In that story in Luke 8, verse 27, the Bible reads, And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils long time. Now, what are devils? They're fallen angels, right? They're angels that have sinned and they disobey God and they're following Satan. Those are devils. And wear no clothes, neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. This is a devil speaking unto Jesus and he says, Jesus, thou Son of God. 
1 John 4 says, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Did the devil just confess that Jesus is the Son of God? He said, Jesus, thou Son of God. He confessed that Jesus is the Son of God. Does that mean that God dwells in him? No, because 1 John 4 is talking about people. It's talking about human beings. It's not talking about angels. They don't have salvation like that. We already know. He said, look, don't torment me before the time. It's not my time yet. I know I'm going to be tormented later, but just wait. Don't do it right now. That's what the devils were saying to Jesus. They knew who he was. They knew he was the Son of God. They confessed that he's the Son of God, but it doesn't mean God's in them because they're different than people. Everything in the Bible applies to human beings, not to angels. So you can't just start saying, well, see, they're sons of God too. No, they're not. They're created beings. They have a purpose, but salvation doesn't work for them the same way. If it's even available, I don't know. I don't know. Why? Because the Bible doesn't record it. And we don't need to know, and it doesn't matter to us. And consider, this is, this is the last point, but these people that believe that the angels are son of God, are sons of God, then that means they're brethren. That means, that means that they believe that the devil is the son of God. Can you imagine that saying Satan's the son of God? You have Jesus who's the son of God, and then you have a, you could say, oh yeah, well the devil's the son of God too. Satan's the son of God, really? Can you get any more blasphemous than saying that Satan is the son of God? And if Satan's the son of God, oh wait, we're starting to get into Mormon doctrine now because that would make Jesus and Satan brothers. They're brothers, right? I mean, hey, if an angel's the son of God, then that means Satan's the son of God. Satan and Jesus, well, they must just be brethren then. I don't think so. And that's why I'm fired up about this more because people get into this stupid stupid doctrine that is so easily disproven but they put their blinders on and they don't want to have the Bible be their final authority they want to believe that angels are sons of God and it's just so much more mystery and, and these things going on and, and oh this explains so much no it doesn't it doesn't there's ample evidence in the Bible and look you know what that kind of downplays the status that God has given unto us because he says, look, we're going to judge the angels. It's a, it's a love that we have received as people. Don't know why. God decided to do things that way. That's the way he did it though. But God decided that he's going to make us his brethren and Jesus isn't even ashamed to call us his brethren and that he's allowed us to be born into his family and become a child. To have the special title being a son of God. How, if just all creation were sons of God, it doesn't quite, it's not quite as, as meaningful as those that he loved and saved when they put their faith in him to say, you know what, now you're my son. You weren't my son before. There are people out there that are sons of the devil, but we could be a son of God. We are sons of God. And the angels are not sons of God by virtue of being created by God. It doesn't work that way. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible and the clear teaching on this, dear Lord. Pray that you would please just um, help us to reach more people the truth of God. We thank you so much with the, the honor of being a son of God and, and all the great things that go along with that, dear Lord, and that we have assurance that because we are begotten by you, that we cannot sin in our spirit. And we, we have the confidence of knowing that when this body passes away, we are, we are saved, we have eternal life, we have everlasting life, and nothing can change that because you have given us incorruptible seed that abides within us, dear Lord. We thank you for that. We thank you so much, humbly, dear Lord, for, for allowing us to become sons of God pray that you would please help us to, to live up to that honor of being a son of God, that we could represent our Father just completely and represent you honorably and, and with integrity, dear Lord, that when people look at us as a son of God, we can reflect 
you and, and, and who you are, dear Lord, and that we can, we can not bring a, a smear or bad name upon you, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to continue to do what's right, dear Lord. Lead us and guide us and teach us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.